Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the State of Gaming. I'm your host, uh, the director of Gaming Wildlife. With me here is my good friend Adam from Cold Steel Games. How are you doing? Hello, Adam? Matt. I'm doing pretty good. Are we allowed to? Are we allowed to curse in this podcast? Yeah, I would. Uh, I would say that I'll, I'll put up a little. I'll put up a little thing at the beginning saying, "Beware, there might be some cursing in here." <laughs> That's good because the. Um, if anyone knows my content, it's just full of vitriol, like profanity. Yeah. So I might get a bit. So, uh, for those of you who probably have been like, why are they, why are you guys doing a podcast? Uh, this is something I've been working on for a while. I wanted to do a podcast talking about the state of gaming. Uh, yeah. the, the, the video, if you're watching it right now, as you can see, I've got a game going on in the background, and that's actually yeah. going to be a big part of a discussion that I'm going to have with Adam later. Um, oh, yeah. The game, the... The rest of the podcast is going to be available. We'll put some links for download in the description if you want to check it out in audio version. But today we begin, Adam, what kind of news do you have in the state of gaming? Okay. Well, I don't exactly have any news at hand, but I have for you a topic hmm. based on a game that's coming out in a couple of days, hmm. and I think we could shed some light and give our insight on that game. Uh -huh. Now, you will know the developers of this game for the Left 4 Dead games, which I know you're a big fan of. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> played them many years back, and we, we need to do more of those. We, we, we need to... That would be great. Uh, what, oh, so what is the game? Evolve. Oh, yes, I have been Let's hearing talk about this. about the Evolve DLC situation. So what has been going on with this? I've definitely heard a lot of people that have been uh, kind of complaining about the Evolve DLC. Like, what's... Oh, no, wait. No, are they the ones who are saying that the Evolve DLC is going to be free? Is that the thing? No. No, okay. I, I no. was... No, I was probably thinking of The Witcher then, because The Witcher was... No, no, be... no, no, no. That, that, that's right. Um, the, the maps, some of the maps in Evolve are going to be free, mm -hmm. but the whole... Basically, the whole Evolve ecosystem is built upon pre-order bonuses and rampant day one DLC. That is a big problem that a lot of games are dealing with right now. And a lot of, there was actually a, a big movement within a lot of the gaming community uh, back before the turn of the year that this entire year was going to be a year of no pre-orders. That every PC gamer was going to get together and say, we will not pre-order any games. Yeah, no, no, that's a good philosophy to have, because then I bought a Unity on day one. Oh, why would you do that? Because, <laughs> because I am so much of a fanboy of Assassin's Creed that I will buy it, but unlike most of the deluded fanboys out there of Assassin's Creed, oh, I'm not even a fanboy, I'm just a fan, mm -hmm. I will tell people if Assassin's Creed Unity sucks. Mm -hmm. I'm currently Let's Playing, and not, not, not to plug, I'm just using this as a, as like a point. Yeah. I'm currently Let's Playing through Assassin's Creed Unity on my channel, and I always have to just scream at the game for the, the amount of broken, incoherent, like, just messes that it makes of itself like you go to kill an enemy mm -hmm. and they'll like zip halfway across the map or there'll be an animation glitch or something or it just won't be that fun to play yeah and yet i bought it day one based on pre-rendered cutscenes. the problem is oh yeah and in the, the problem <laughs> and, and i remember uh seeing the e3 video of assassin's creed and uh it, it showed some gameplay on it but it felt like it was very choreographed it felt like we yeah, were seeing a lot of like we go to here and then some people say stuff and then we move yeah. over here like they had meticulously planned out the yeah. gameplay part of the trailer to yeah. basically just flow as good as well as they could make it and then yeah. just shove out the game as quickly as possible <laughs> exactly and to be honest well when you go back and i remember a specific trailer from e3 2013 where it was called the black box the black box trailer and what it was it was saying well we're gonna have this whole open playground and missions mm -hmm. an assassination mission can turn into a chase mission can turn into a, a locate mission can turn into a you know a, all these types of missions and that never happens in the game at all and i know this because it's like an assassination mission right you go it's like all right here's how many entrances you have here's how many guards and stuff here's how many hiding places go and kill the person you do that and then you run off and that's what happens every single time. There's never any variation. Mm -hmm. 
And it's like there are things they advertise which straight up never like came to fruition in any capacity whatsoever in Unity. So are we just like because we made a video about this a while back? Are we just putting a total boycott on anything that Ubisoft does? Is there anything yeah. good that's coming I, out? I'm consider I I'm I mean Ubisoft up until last year my favorite developer as mentioned <laughs> that just shows you how much I've been burned by the company. I mean I I was the one who wrote the the, the script to be 100 percent honest by bashed you. Yeah. Oh God, we need to do an update to that just where we just bash Ubisoft. For like we we like we will sell you half baked games mm -hmm. and so on. They I've been I've been trying to develop one uh for a hundred percent honest where Ubisoft, Activision and oh, so Elec yeah, yeah. and Electronic Arts all band yes. together to basically be we have become the culmination of the worst of gaming. <laughs> we we are the Axis powers of gaming, motherfucker. <laughs> Something like that. We we are we are the Germany and the Russians and we will come and invade your the gaming countries and take you all down. Uh, oh God, the, they're the Nazis! No, the, no, that's the, terrible. The the the, the, the camps the camp of DLC and season passes. It's terrible. So there's been a rumor flying around. A lot of people have been talking about this, and I wanted to see if I could get your opinion on it. Sure. Netflix is developing a Legend of Zelda oh, yeah. series. Yeah. Um, I, I, I have the original Zelda series on DVD. Excuse me, Ian. The the animated one, and it's terrible. It's know, horrible. It's, it's one of the worst things. And I'm just wondering, because every time you hear about a new project being done by Nintendo that isn't games-related, like if someone's making a Pokemon MMO, it gets you know completely destroyed. If someone's yeah. making a Zelda movie, even if it's a fan-made project, I've seen so many times them get completely like, Nintendo comes in and says, you have to stop doing this. And despite the fact that Nintendo is directly operating, uh, like directly supposedly working with Netflix to do this, I still feel like it's not going to come to fruition, that something's going to fall apart in the end. That the Legend of Zelda, whenever, just no matter what, especially with the original series, lasted nine episodes. I might be wrong about Christ. that. But, it, but it's still, I'm just thinking, could this yeah. actually work? Well, interesting point. I'm just going to divert slightly to what you said mm -hmm. previously. The, the Legend of Zelda nine-episode run was off the back of the Super Mario Brothers Super Show, which is no, like a live-action, yeah. like, animated crossover type of thing. Mm. And I used to watch that show all the time, because it used to rerun constantly. And every, like, couple of weeks, they would have a Legend of Zelda episode. And it was awful. I mean, as you said, it was just... One of the episodes, and of course, you know, the Excuse Me Princess. I mean, <laughs> it, made, it made the Zelda CDI games animation look good. Oh, God, yes. <laughs> <laughs> there is nothing good about either of those products. Yeah. Oh, uh, things. But with, with, um, with the Zelda television show, I don't... Again, it just it sounds too far-fetched because it's all concept at the moment. It's like, well, there's no writer attached to this. There's no director attached to this. There's no nothing attached to this. It's just kind of an idea. Netflix will throw money at an idea. Hey, we're Netflix. Hey, guess what? New Daredevil TV series. New Luke Cage uh, TV series. Yeah. We're going to give you more Arrested Development. Oh, and by the way, here's Legend of Zelda. Maybe. Who knows? <laughs> it's a possibility. I yeah. like a lot of the content that Netflix is creating, and if there's one medium that could probably pull this off well, it is Netflix, but I just, I'm worried that it's going to completely crash. I'm worried that we're going to get, uh, we're going to get this big Zelda idea, and it's just not going to work out because it's, you know, it, Nintendo has never really tried the route, I mean, they, well, that's not true, they did, they tried the route with, like, the Super Mario Brothers Super Show, the Zelda series, yeah. um, the Mario Brothers movie, and oh, none God. of those are good. None of them. No. Um, and people, I've got friends who like the Mario Brothers movie, and they go, "I am, I am aware, I am aware that it's stupid, but I still like it." And I just go, "Have you really? Nothing about that is enjoyable." <laughs> and, and not only that, it really signified the path of. How uh, of how video game movies would be made in the future? It was it was given entire all the 
power was given to the directors yeah. to say, we can do with this idea whatever the hell we want. We don't have to follow the original concepts. We just need the names, and we need stuff that the fanboys can jerk it to. So yeah. because of the, And because the Super Mario Brothers movie did that, it's just now anyone has free reign to be able to just basically put a name over anything and say, oh, that's a movie. Example, yep. Spirits Within. I didn't think that was a terrible film, but it has nothing to do with Final Fantasy. Yeah, but it's like look, look at look at look at the look at the movie about Doom. Oh yes, I feel terrible for liking that movie because, and I know that film is is terrible. It's one of the worst it's, it's things it's ever. Slot, okay. But it's Don't, it's kind of fun. To go to hell. <laughs> it's, it's already paid. It's, it has nothing to do because the in the movie. Especially in the movie, it's about uh, it's about like the twenty fourth. They figure out the twenty fourth chromosome, and all the monsters are human mutations. Yeah, and that's not Doom. That's not Doom. Doom is Doom is. You're the last Marine. Yeah, you're gonna go to hell. Mm -hmm. You're gonna kill everything. Yeah, and when you stop killing everything, you're gonna kill more things. And when you're done killing everything, you're gonna go and have a sandwich. Chill out for a bit, and then guess what we're going to do afterward? Kill more things. Yeah. And trying to put a plot to that doesn't really work. I mean, like, look at Doom 3. Doom 3 is awesome to some people and awful to others. Because mm. it was like, survival horror, jump scare, jump scare, woo, mm. look in the mirror. And like, they tried to do that with the film, but it failed so horribly because it wanted to be action, wanted to be this mainstream thing with a hard-hitting plot and... and air quotations good actors and yeah. <laughs> stuff and it just ended up falling flat on every cylinder I mean yeah. they cast like what was it Dwayne the Rock Johnson as Doom guy <laughs> no they that that's the thing is that the Doom movie didn't even follow the I like the story of Doom they didn't even follow Doom 3 as a story it was basically a group of Marines are sent into the Doom labs or something to try and eliminate this threat, and it turns out it's a bunch of mutated humans, and then a bunch of zombies show up, and then people start mutating into the monsters because they've all got the 24th chromosome going through their veins. It's It, it has nothing... My, my biggest problem isn't necessarily that it's a stupid action film. My biggest problem is that they didn't follow any of the backstory of Doom. Like, you could have gone from Doom 3. Doom 3, Demons from Hell. It was always yeah. Demons from Hell. This yep. one's not Demons from Hell. This one is, uh, like, laboratory experiments gone wrong. That's Resident Evil. This isn't uh, Doom. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, even, the, even the blurb for this movie on IMDb, <laughs> Space Marines are sent to investigate strange events at a research facility on Mars and find themselves at the mercy of genetically enhanced killing machines. So, Resident Evil. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Evil is just so there's this guy and he has this mansion, the Spencer Mansion, and he makes this big virus to try and control things, to weaponize it, and to to make society bend to his whim using these horrible experiments. And instead, it was like we should make that, but call it Doom. Yeah, I've got my own. I, I've got my own pet peeves on the Resident Evil movie series, but I'll get to that in a different podcast. That will take up One the day. entire thing. One day. So. I don't do uh, Nintendo Let's Plays all that often. Uh, do you ever do Nintendo Let's Plays? Um, no. It's it's really weird. Mm -hmm. Well, there's two reasons for this, mm -hmm. and I know I know what you're getting on to. And yeah. I'd love to explain this with you. Two reasons for this. The first reason is Nintendo games cost a lot of money, and I have a gaming computer where games cost like half as much. So there's more incentive for me to buy Dying Light than there is to buy. Yeah. Uh, Majora's Mask 3D on 3DS, even though I have a 3DS and a Vita and all that stuff. Yeah, but streaming I, I, from 3DS is kind of difficult. <laughs> yeah, but like you know about like Wii U streaming or like Nintendo 64 streaming and like playing those types of games, uh, home console games. And no, I just I just didn't really. And I, I've done like three. I did like New Super Mario Brothers mm -hmm. and uh, Zombie U, mm -hmm. I think. And the reason I stopped was because I broke the controller, but I, I, I wouldn't have... I dropped it on carpet, like, five feet in the air. It shouldn't have broken. Yikes. Um, I, I may have thrown it. That might have been a lie, but... Oh, no. Nintendo games can be can be pretty, like, 
just like ah makes you pissed off really easily. Yeah, Donkey was, Kong sixty four does that for me. I have to like take breaks from playing that game just so I don't just like throw the controller in agony. Like ah, why do I keep dying? Toss. I have to t I have to keep taking breaks from GTA four because I'm replaying that game for the mm -hmm. first time since like two thousand and eight. Mm -hmm. Got further in it now, but mm -hmm. anyway. So to get back on point, no, I didn't really ever let's play Nintendo games, but. But given you, the given the whole uh, Nintendo network, Nintendo Creator program, though, they can go to hell. Yeah. The, this has been a problem that has been coming with Nintendo and Let's Players for a long time. Especially oh, yeah. when we first started doing our Let's Play channel, I did a lot of um, I did a lot of research into how Let's Play channels are fair, are able to be successful, and one yeah. of the and one of the reasons why we have stopped updating is mostly because it's just you know we've got so many other things going on. But also, because I want to let's play a lot of Nintendo games, but taking Nintendo IPs, the problem is they will claim copyright on your they videos, will. and they've never really updated that. There's been uh, there's been an update this week that says that to have Nintendo uh, to have Nintendo content like your channel affiliated with Nintendo, you need to remove all non Nintendo content from your channel, which would yeah. basically mean that if we were to do a let's play channel, it would have to be a Nintendo only channel. Yeah, and you eventually have to sell your soul to Nintendo. Yeah, and I'm not really willing to do that. But yeah. there's also like some people have been saying that it's it, it's not a, you know it, it's not a hundred percent that way. It's not you don't have to do it that way. But Nintendo's always been sort of the big problem areas with the Let's Play community, especially yeah, when definitely. especially when we first started uh, doing Let's Plays. Like a lot of people are saying, Minecraft is overdone. Don't do Minecraft. Um, Happy Wheels is overdone. Don't do uh, Happy Wheels. Play Thanks, games that you Thanks, feel... Uh, call, the Call of Duty series isn't quite as good for Let's Play. But play games that no. you want to play that you enjoy. But the big one they said, don't do Nintendo games at all. Yeah. And so... Risky. Yeah, we'll live cast Nintendo games every so often. But yeah. trying to do a Let's... Like an ongoing Let's Play of them would just be kind of a, a pain. And especially with this new Definitely. Nintendo... Like uh, affiliated channels with Nintendo is just being a big problem right now. Yeah. And the reason for this is that Nintendo, I mean, the the, the, the higher-ups at Nintendo still have their rose-tinted glasses on. They still think they're living in 1985, you know? Yeah. They're looking around, seeing Nintendo Entertainment Systems everywhere, CRTs everywhere, you know? Mm -hmm. Nintendo basically want you to sign over your soul. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing. Here's the thing, again, as I was saying, Nintendo... Are living in 1985. They don't realize that Let's Plays and walkthroughs and streams of their games are free advertising. Because Nintendo is still with this prehistoric mindset of we're Nintendo. We can do what we like. Blah de blah de blah. The reason the Wii U isn't selling, there's no fucking adverts for it. There's no adverts for the Wii U. Anywhere. Adverts for the 3DS, but not for the Wii U. And they bitch, well the Wii U's not selling. And the reason for this is because there's no advertisements. And the reason for that is because, oh, we don't need advertisements. We're Nintendo. Oh, you can't put up a copy of our game online and play it with your friends because we're Nintendo. <laughs> and they got to realize that they're not like, they're not the alpha dogs anymore. They're yeah. not like, they're not the pinnacle of gaming anymore. It's not 1985 anymore. So the big thing that Nintendo can do to improve, uh, to, to improve themselves, I feel as though it's not, and it's not even necessarily about um, advertising uh, the Wii U more. It's just about the Wii U needs more support from third party uh, companies. Oh, yeah. No, big time. Uh, the big thing, like, the big problem with the Wii U right now is that you've got a great first party support, you've got a lot of great games. For first parties, and though you're not doing a lot of advertising, um, and, and you know, say what you will about the quality of the games, but you need to be yeah. able to branch out. Nintendo's one of the few companies that still does a dedicated video games machine by itself. Yes, and, definitely. And the problem is, is that that's that's great if you want to keep doing that, but you have to put more effort into advertising. But the big thing is, you need third party support. You need to be able to go the route that PlayStation 2 did back in 2000. PlayStation yes. 2 basically said, anyone can develop games for us. And they yeah. had one of the biggest libraries ever. Of course. I mean, the, Nint the Nintendo, the, the PlayStation 2 lasted 12 and a half years. Mm -hmm. That's unheard of for any system. Yeah. And not only that, it's still, to this day, is the highest grossing... Like, it's 
the, 250 million units. Well, at, that's actually the thing. Like, the, the 3DS is getting... Or no, not the 3DS. The Nintendo DS came close to beating that. But the problem was, a lot of the sales of the PlayStation 2s weren't... Uh, properly uh, recorded. So 150 isn't even an accurate number. It's higher than that. We don't know what we don't know what the actual number is, but even everyone had a PS2. Everyone does. Everyone. I still do. My roommate oh, my, does. My, mine's in my drawer. I can yeah. just there. I can see it. See I can go get it right now. It's just like look, there it is. I, I, mean, I could go, I could I could take it out of the drawer and hold it. You know, it's. It's, I love the PS2. And if the, if Nintendo could really figure out a way to get to. Be able to advertise more, yes, but also get a lot more third-party support. It would help them immensely in being able to sell their system. Yeah. But here's the thing, is that in 2012, Nintendo were like... So you remember the Wii, basically, like, everyone had one for, like, six months, and everyone forgot about them, right? Yeah. We're not going to do that again. Instead... Stay with me. We're going to get all of these companies on board, like Ubisoft. They're going to develop Zombie U and Assassin's Creed 3. And we're going to have Batman Arkham City and all of that. It's all going to come to the Wii U. The Wii U is going to have all the third-party games. And then? And, like, and then eight months later, anyone want to play Mario Party 9? <laughs> Mario goes down to co-op for some sweets. <laughs> it, yeah, it's, it's just kind of... it's. Yeah, it's not doing well for Nintendo. Oh no! All right, but 20, 2014 was a solid year, like for their games. I mean, like Bayonetta two, Mario Kart eight, you know, loads of those sort of games yeah. that were pretty good by most standards. So, there's uh, Adam. I know you're not American, so you don't know I'm British. British. Yes, you you don't know a whole lot about American stuff. But uh, a couple weeks ago was oh no, it was actually last week. Well. When this airs, it would have been a couple of weeks now. We did yeah. a thing called the Super Bowl, which is big uh, sports thing that a lot of Americans do. It's our big, uh, it's like the biggest sport thing of the year, and a lot of companies will pay big money the advertising. to throw oh, I've, crazy I've seen, advertising. I've seen, I've seen the adverts, man. Three different mobile games could afford Super Bowl commercials. There is a okay. Clash of Titans. Commercial. Yeah, the, the Clash of Clans Liam Neeson one. With I Liam will, Neeson. Will Liam you, Neeson. Yeah. What, like, That's... what the hell is this saying about mobile games that they can afford Liam Neeson and a Super Bowl commercial? That's ungodly amount of money like because, i can't that's that's yeah. millions that's hundreds of millions of dollars to be able to is, do both of those is. things you're right and the, the simple the simple answer to this is that, that most of these mobile games in air quotations aren't games they they are cash cows yeah and they be, these developers they rely on the whales the these sort of people that spend hundreds of dollars at a time on these games or maybe like maybe oh a small increment of 69 pence or of a um, hundred a uh, uh, pound 20 that sort of thing on these games and it's like small things like oh I mean, even like my mother and my like a few people people in my family is like oh well is a new uh, a surfboard for subway surfers <laughs> for example or some new keys for Candy Crush, yeah. that sort of thing. Small things that builds up because everyone has a smartphone, and everyone wants to find a little small piece of entertainment. Yeah. And some don't want to go the emulate the emulator route route. Some don't want to go the the way of you know uh, swipe control platformers and so on. Some just want a cheap. You know, maybe even free. Oh, it's like I swipe a screen for three minutes and then it updates for me 12 times a day telling me to keep swiping the screen. Yeah. They want dumb entertainment. They want it quick and they just want something just to swipe when they're bored. And they don't mind giving, you know, a pound or 69 pence or whatever it is to, to get these small, like, little upgrades. Yeah. But I just, I, I'm wondering, though, because... Especially with Clash of Clans, I kind of wanted to talk about that because I don't play Clash of Clans. I've never really. I, I touched on it like once. It's like a like an article, but I never like played it properly. And I've got some because I've got some mobile games. I've actually gone back to playing uh, Plants vs Zombies again. The the yeah, mobile Plants vs Zombies is fucking fantastic, and it, and it was great. I think it originally started on mobile and then uh, went to yeah. PC port and a lot went of other to PC, things. PC, Xbox Live, and it became this whole big thing because it's a great game. Yeah. So I'm wondering because I because. Mobile games is I've never I've never been big into mobile games, but I also want oh. to keep uh, keep up with a lot of popular things in gaming, obviously because I want to 
uh, you know, I want to kind of stay, not stay ahead of the curve, but I kind of want to stay within the curve. I want to be able yeah, to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you want to be, you want to be informed, you know? So uh, is, is Clash of Clans worth playing at all? Like, oh, which is fucking not. Then how the hell can they... Because this is where all the money is going, and the money is going to go, yeah. like, in, in a direction that's... Because it used to be the money went into the you know the big powerful games, and now they're going yeah. into these mobile ones. And I'm yep. just wondering if in ten years mobile games are just going to be the not the only thing, but the biggest thing ever, where all of a lot of the new technology goes into because that's where the money yeah. goes. I'm and just wondering if that's what's gonna that's what's gonna be the future of gaming is we're just gonna be like oh everything's on mobile at this point. Yeah, well, two interesting points that you brought up there that I'm going to expand upon. Mm -hmm. The first thing is, as I said earlier, everyone has a smartphone. Yeah. You know, little, like, 13-year-old kids have smartphones, have iPhone 6s. You know, I mean, I've got a Sony Z1, you know, mm -hmm. so I've got, like, a smartphone. Everyone has a smartphone nowadays. And it's the availability. I mean, because here's the thing. You said, you know, why aren't the, this big money going to game developers and indies and that sort of thing? And that's because... Not everyone has a big computer or a 360 yeah. or uh, an Xbox One or a PS4 or Wii U, whatever. But everyone has a smartphone and it reaches out to, to like, I mean, it's like, for example, you wouldn't see, like, the average, like, 15-year-old, you know, uh, bring me the horizon weirdo-looking, like, 15-year-old girl who goes on her phone and, you know, plays Candy Crush. You wouldn't see her sat down you know, on a on a on a settee mm -hmm. with a controller in her hand, playing the newest, uh, you know, the newest Elder Scrolls game, for example. Yeah. And it's mainly about the availability and the, you know, the accessibility of having something like that in your pocket at all times. Mm -hmm. but the other problem uh, is that there's a lot of it, this is especially true with iPhones, though. I don't. Uh, I am officially no longer part of the Apple Club. I have yay. gotten. I have gotten. A, my laptop unfortunately died last year, and I've gotten oh, a damn. and I've gotten a smartphone that is not an Apple phone; it is an Android phone. So Which I've I, officially left. Android. I've officially left the Apple Club, but I do remember that one of the things that happens with a lot of mobile games on Apple devices is that it's really easy to spend a lot of money on it because you can basically connect. Uh, your credit card to it, and then it yeah. just sort of automatically takes it out whenever. Yeah. So, when it, whenever it feels like it. So, a lot of mobile games have that built in. The idea of oh, yeah. the idea of you press a button and then, oh, there's $5, but you just got, you know, 20 more lives into this game. Um, yep. And it's causing them to, and it gets them to make a lot of money because, hell, Liam Neeson in a Super Bowl commercial. There you go. That is hundreds of millions of dollars went into that. And I just think, is this, like, is there... A, is this a, a trend that's going to die out, or is this a trend that's going to continue because it's a really, really, really easy way to make money off of people? Yeah. Is to make them well, pay over and over again for the same game. Yeah, <laughs> and I I do... Again, there, there's some sense in that. I mean, th this, sh this shows us two things. I mean, the first thing it shows us is that people with a smartphone will play anything and will spend money without even thinking about it. Well, basically, we'll just, we'll just become subconsciously spending on these these freemium games mm -hmm. without even thinking about it. And two, it also shows that Liam Neeson will do anything for money. <laughs> well, I think we that was... Take a, three exists. This isn't like, this isn't a, uh, a movies podcast. This is kind of a video games podcast. So yeah. I, it's pretty obvious that, yeah, Liam Neeson will kind of do any movie. And in a way, I respect him for that, sort of like a Kevin Bacon kind of guy. That's an entirely different topic. It's just... I'm just surprised as to how much money Clash of Clans could throw at that. Yeah, it's. I mean, I mean, the, the money for. I mean, I'm 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 willing to bet. You know, you got to think like worldwide, the the hundreds of millions of downloads mm -hmm. and active users. That 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 was probably pocket change for the developers. Here you go, Liam Neeson. Here, yeah. go go run us a, a Super Bowl ad. Thank you, Liam Neeson. That, that was it. It's like, oh, well, let me just reach into my back pocket for you. Yeah. yeah it probably wasn't even like a scratch on the company. Mm. And you got to think, that, 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 that advert. And the same with the, uh, did you watch the game of, the game of War Fire Age? Uh, yeah. They've got, uh, uh, and they've got that one lady who's really popular because she's got big boobs. I honestly yeah, Kate, cannot remember. Kate Upton. Kate Upton. Yeah. I, for the longest time, I have said to myself, who the hell is Kate Upton? When, like... 
and I don't want to be one of those hipsters like I don't follow the I don't follow the popular celebrities and I want you to know that I don't follow the popular yeah. celebrities. I honestly haven't the slightest freaking clue who Kate Upton is. I don't know well, why I, she's I famous. I can tell you who Kate Upton is. Okay. Kate Upton is a pair of breasts attached to a woman. So every famous model ever? <laughs> oh yeah. No, she she she's famous for her, for being like well endowed in the female tit department, I guess. Okay, That's... well, there's been a lot of women who have been well endowed in the female tit department. That is uh, true. Over the history of everything, <laughs> the, the the race, the 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 gender, I dare not venture into. Yeah, but yes, that uh, that I'm just I'm just worried. Like I'm partially worried, but also partially just interested in how mobile gaming is going to evolve from here. If it's going to keep yeah. up with the with the Skinner Box idea, which is basically what most mobile games are. In fact, i got a future episode coming up about that. And oh, yeah. uh, and just about, like, are they going to be able to... Are we going to be able to evolve to the point where we can have a, a game that is in-depth as, say, Skyrim or Fallout on mobile? Is, are mobile devices going to be able to handle that? Well, interesting point, because, as you say, you know, in 10 years, what will happen? I fully believe, I mean, in 10 years' time, I mean, if you, like, you know, pick up your phone, like, right now, you know, you go on to, like, these games that cost 7 or 8 pounds at a time, and <laughs> you got to think about it like this, you know, you can play Grand Theft Auto San Andreas on a phone. Yes. And that game came out in 2006, right? So think about it, in 10 years' time... Are we going to be able to play games like Wolfenstein: The New Order and Thief 2014 hmm. on these on, on our phones, on our Android and iOS devices? First of all, why would you play Thief 2014? It was terrible. <laughs> I let I let's play that game too, and yes, it fucking sucks. It's oh it, uh, oh, you're not dishonored. <laughs> Big, biggest just no, seriously, biggest disappointment of my life. I waited like eleven years. Because I remember playing, I remember I was really young and I played Deadly Shadows. Hmm. I waited 11 fucking years for FIFA <laughs> 2014. Are you uh, breaking my heart, Square Enix? So, there's all that. Um, so, I got a question for you. Um, what is your opinion of Luigi as a character? Well, Louis, Luigi's year was last year, wasn't it? We had the year of Luigi with uh, Dark, uh, Luigi's Mansion 2, Dark Moon, and New Super Luigi U. He's he's just he's like if you have a, an older brother and a younger brother he's the one that the younger brother is forced to play mm -hmm. that you just sort of get along you know oh okay fine you know mm -hmm. no one really likes Luigi even though arguably he's a better character than Mario he's faster he can jump higher he's taller he's nicer in mm -hmm. some ways but no one cares about him because he's not the main character right that was actually something that I wanted to bring up because I know you're younger than me yes. Um and I, the way that I've been seeing Luigi evolve over the years, I feel like he's a very, like, a really well-written character. A really amazingly positive character. There was a... He is. There, uh, and not only, mostly because, and this is from, this is the filmmaker in inside of my brain coming out and saying that he's got a lot of characterization. Whereas Mario yeah. is very much like Link, sort of a blank slate character. He doesn't really have a whole lot of character. He's meant no. to be sort of the the very bland everyman that anyone can project themselves into. Whereas Luigi, I feel as though, actually gets a lot of interesting uh, characterization throughout the throughout yeah, all of the games. Especially with Luigi's Mansion Dark Moon, he seems upon very much a put upon every man in the game. He feel and especially there's little moments they did this in the GameCube version and I loved this where he will hum along with the theme song when he's walking around and he's just like Yeah. Eh. <laughs> and if you can feel the emotion behind him he's afraid he's scared yeah. um one of the one of the there was a post that made the front page of our gaming on reddit this week that i thought was a really cool one and it's a picture of luigi uh future ian go ahead and put it up in post and uh uh, for people watching the video, and it says, Brave is the man who fights. Braver is the man who is afraid and fights anyway. And I feel yeah. as though that was a really that was a really key component to Dark Moon. Because it shows that Luigi as a character is afraid. He shows that he has a level yeah. of fear, he has emotions. I feel like this makes him a better character, oddly enough, than Mario. And I was just wondering I, if you had the, yeah, a similar opinion about it. 
Well, in in that respect, yeah, I mean, Luigi is definitely more, he's more of a character than Mario. Mm -hmm. Mario represents, he's sort of like this, not really like uh, ultimate aspirations, but he's kind of like, hey, even if you're fat and even if you're fat Mm -hmm. and, you know, you can go and get the princess and everything can work out fine and you can go and be this ultimate power trip but Luigi as you said is the character who has emotions who can feel fear and contentment and you know and anger and so on mm-hmm. and he's he's the more human of the two really and especially like with Luigi like in a uh, new Luigi U and some of the missions it's all time attack modes mm-hmm. so he has to play the modes from the original New Super Mario Bros. game, mm-hmm. but way faster, and there's like more emotion in like like the way that like it's set out because it's like he knows in a way that Luigi's never gonna like he's never gonna get Peach, mm-hmm. so he's not exactly fighting for that. He's just fighting because you know he can really, and that's like we'll talk. We'll actually talk about that. There's a game theorist episode where they talk oh, about yeah, so the relationship the Mario between sociopath episode. Well, not only that, they also talk about the relationship between Luigi and Peach. But we'll talk about that in the future uh, podcast because that's because that's, that's kind of interesting. But yeah. I just uh, I mean I was just wondering. And, you know, as a younger man, you probably have played... You've probably got a different perspective on the Mario games than I have. The ones that were coming out when I was a kid were the, you know, SNES-era Mario games of, like... Yeah. The late NES-era Mario 3 and Mario World were the ones coming out when I was, like, first being introduced to Nintendo and all that. Yeah. Um, but it's... Yeah, I just... I feel like... Luigi as a character, I feel like this is a thing that a lot of uh, a lot of people who are older Nintendo fans really like Luigi as a character because he is a complex character. He's a well-written yes. character and a person who is allowed to show emotions and especially in Mario in Paper Mario, he's constantly fighting back to well, he's constantly envious of his brother about uh, all yes. the stuff that his brother is going to do. In Paper Mario uh, Thousand Year Door, he goes on this big adventure. Is that the Wii one? That uh, no, that was the GameCube one. Oh, in Thousand Year Door, he goes on this big adventure that you're never quite sure if it's real or not because it always seems like he's boasting up. Oh yes, I'm on this big adventure in parallel universe <laughs> world where I get to do so many great things but you're never 100 percent sure if it's real it always feels like he's kind of a little bit inadequate um to his brother because his brother is getting to do all this great stuff and then in super paper mario he becomes uh a superhero basically he becomes a superhero that comes in and just does these amazing stuff and so you just get to see this progression of a character of luigi throughout uh, a whole bunch of different games and especially with uh Especially with the Luigi's Mansion series, I feel as though it's always been a great way to characterize and show his fear, but that he's also still able to push forward and help out his brother in the end. Yeah, hell, definitely. the the final the the final um, thing that you see in Super Mario uh, in, in uh, Luigi's Mansion One, final thing that happened. It's one of the best moments in a video game I've ever seen. Is when Mario is rescued, Luigi breaks down and cries. Because he's like, oh my god, I almost lost my brother. And he like starts yeah. tearing up and is legitimately crying while Mario's sitting on the floor going, oh, what the hell happened to me? Yeah. And it's this great little characterization moment that I think just yeah. makes Luigi such an amazing character. You know, it's good. And that actually reminds me of a scene from, uh, from Luigi's Mansion. I don't know if you remember it, but there's a scene where he has like a sort of like a nightmare like when there's like a thunderstorm and he's like a bit more worried it's like toward the end of the game and mm-hmm. every time the thunder hits you see like a silhouette of what looks like his hanging body mm-hmm. in a way and that represents his existential fear yeah there was actually a uh, screenshot from the original um development where luigi actually turns into a ghost and it's this sort of like deep eyed creepy looking luigi who's this like horrible ghost looking thing it's just like ah it's nice. very creepy all right so I've got a topic. Uh, the big topic I kind of wanted to talk about for this episode, and we'll do this for like the last, uh, like, we'll do this for the last part of the podcast. Sure. Um, I've been playing some indie games recently, and oh, yes. uh, for this entire episode, I've been playing in the background a. Uh, I've uh, for the first time ever because I am way behind on stuff like this. I played Limbo. 
Oh yeah, so Limbo is fantastic. And Limbo's Limbo's a fascinating game. Um, but I've it also is. I also wanted to talk about games. Uh, a lot of other indie games, um, such as like Papers Please. And, oh, Papers Please is brilliant. And Dear Esther. Faster than light. And yeah, I wanted to I wanted to talk about some of these uh, art artsy indie games is the big thing that I wanted to talk about with you today because I feel like we might clash a little bit on this. Oh, um, good. A debate, yeah. Awesome. Artsy, uh, a lot of artsy indie games like Dear Esther, I, I, to be honest, I wouldn't include Papers, Please, but it is kind of along those same uh, lines and uh, Limbo, in a way, focus a lot on trying to make video games art. Oh, okay. Yeah, all right. I'm, I'm, up, I'm up with you now. But, I get it. They, but they're very lacking in fun gameplay, I feel like. Yeah, Dear Esther. Uh, Dear Esther, especially Dear this Esther game. Sucks. Well, I now I wouldn't even say that. Even that is the thing. Dear Esther, I feel like tells it kind of an interesting story. Um, I feel yeah. like uh, Limbo is very kind of vague in its story, but it's supposed to be sort of this ambiguous ending that a lot of people, um, you know, can can kind of like interpret in their own way. The one thing, one question I wanted to ask you is: as video yeah. games are trying to become more artistic. Do you feel like a lot of indie games try and emphasize more of the artistic standpoint rather than the gameplay standpoint? Do you feel like a game can still be artistic while having fun gameplay? Well, I can answer your question with a... Not, not an indie game, but just a, a game in general. Mm -hmm. Bioshock Infinite. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Bioshock Infinite. Infinite's got a, fun, a great story. It's a fun game, amazing art style, fantastic story. But the thing, like, uh, and... I don't want to use Infinite as uh, an example because it was made by a big company, Irrational. But yeah, Irrational was... also went uh, also went defunct trying to finish the game, is the it thing. Is. And yeah, unlike... They... And unlike 3D Realms, they make they made a good game because 3D Realms made Duke ne went defunct making Duke Nukem Forever. I will forever blame Gearbox <laughs> for that game. I don't believe 3D Realms was entirely to blame. I actually wouldn't. Do, I wouldn't uh, blame Gearbox because honestly, it was. Uh, and I remember uh, Ben Croshaw, the guy who uh, Yahtzee, Yahtzee, yes. The guy who does Zero Punctuation. Oh, what? You mean the, when, when he did the fake review of it? When he did the fake review of it, he specifically video. stated, this is a game yeah, This out. is a game that a competent studio could have farted out in a year, and quite literally, a competent studio farted it out a year later. Because yeah. 3D Realms had, you know, done a whole lot of yeah. stuff. But we're getting off track. I could talk forever about Duke Nukem Forever and why... And why I it's such a balls of steel. We could talk about that one next week. Actually, I could go. Oh, I yes. could go an entire podcast about Duke Nukem Forever and the problems with it. But um, it's Halo with a Duke Nukem reskin. Eh. <laughs> but the uh, but with artsy indie games, especially with Limbo, the one thing I loved about Limbo was like the first hour of gameplay, which is probably yeah. what a lot of people are going to be seeing. Because it's very atmospheric and gets you into this weird mindset. I'm going to be doing little puzzles here and there. There's going to yep. be creepy monsters that I'm going to have to run past. And there's this tribe of people who are trying to kill me. And then there's this random girl that keeps showing up. I don't know who she is. And then the second half of the game is puzzle, 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 ending. And yep. the ending is so abrupt that it feels very jarring. Um, yep. Now, originally what I thought was going to happen is the game... Because once you get past... It, it does sort of feel like as soon as they kind of ran out of ideas for puzzles because they didn't want to repeat everything, it just sort of ends. The one thing that I thought would have had a really cool ending is if it truly was Limbo. Because the very f last thing you do in the game reflects the very first thing you do in the game is you fall so it comes full circle yeah so it comes full circle i thought that would have been a really cool thing if the game literally kept looping but it didn't it nice. it then comes That's back good. it comes back to the girl and it's a very ambiguous ending yeah. i didn't like it and i feel bad about that because there's a lot of there's a lot going into the game. There's a lot of thought put into the game. There's a lot of yeah. ideas put into the game, but they 
I because I don't want to I, I don't want to hate on an indie studio for making a game that was you know their big that was their big project. I mean, like it would yep. be like hating on Super Meat Boy. They spent all their resources to get that game finished. Yep. But whereas Super Meat Boy focused almost entirely on the gameplay, Limbo focused more on the story, and I feel I as though like atmosphere. It the atmosphere's great for the first hour, and then I completely lost. And one thing that I always stand by, I completely lost my immersion because really? well, for the for the thing is. I'm a terrible. Let, let me just tell you this. I'm a terrible gamer. I'm like the one of the worst gamers out there because I'm very bad at video games. I usually play them <laughs> on easy just so I can get the experience of playing it. Uh, oh, yeah. But the puzzles in the second half get really challenging, and it got to the point where I would actually have to stop the game okay. and yeah, look up a walkthrough. And I don't. And I didn't want to do that because it's like, I don't want this game to defeat me. I want to be able to get past this. But I had yeah. such a smooth feeling going through the first half that was completely taken, that was completely jarring when I got to the, like, really difficult puzzles. Just going, oh my god, I have to go through, oh my god, I have to push the, like, levitate these and push this onto the ceiling. And yeah. then there's a brain maggot eating my head. And I have to, you know, constantly run right and I can't run left. The puzzles just got, I felt, a bit too challenging, and there yep. wasn't enough atmosphere, that it was just puzzles after that point. Sort of yep. an, an inverse of Portal, that I felt like Portal was a game that... Uh, Portal and Portal 2, and I loved both of those games. Same, same. Uh, were games that I felt as though were able to combine artistic merit with having a really dark story, but yeah, also yeah. really fun gameplay. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, especially with uh, with I mean, with Portal, you know, you got you got the you got the black comedy going on. You've got like this bleak realization that no matter what you do is just futile, and you're under constant surveillance from this big all-seeing machine. Mm -hmm. And well, getting on to what you said about Limbo, mm -hmm. I haven't got that amazing experience with that game, but I do have experience with a game called Deadlight. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard of it? I've, uh, I unfortunately do not have the money to purchase Deadlight at the moment, but I have heard many good things about it. I'll, uh, I'll, in fact, see if I can play that uh, and have that ready for when we do our next podcast. Well, well, Deadlight, it's a similar to like Limbo, it's sort of not like entirely black and whitish, but like sort of cell shadedy, black and white, apocalyptic, -y, like Walking Dead looking, mm -hmm. two like two and a half D platformer, right? And I had the same problems with, with that game as you did with Limbo, mm -hmm. in the fact that I disagreed with the ending completely. The ending made no sense because that game is beautiful. Deadlight is a beautiful game. Because you go through it, and it's horrific. It really is, but like, and the puzzles can get a bit much at times too, to a point where it stops being fun. Mm -hmm. I will admit, same with Limbo, from what you said. But here's the thing. The ending of Deadlight is, you play as, in, as a guy named Randall, and throughout the whole game, you're looking for your wife and child. And you go through the, you know, the entire game, you go on this whole epic journey through these suburbs, all the way to this facility. Mm -hmm. You know, you dodge all these zombies, you meet it with survivors, you, you, you kill people, you make important decisions. And then it comes down to the last ten minutes that almost ruined the game for me entirely. Mm -hmm. And this is how. So, you're about to, like, leave the gate to this, like, this like army re like this renovated army facility mm -hmm. and there, there's a boat but you and this woman who is this woman who is like a friend of his yeah you could you could escape but only one of you can escape right mm -hmm. and you're about to get on the boat and she's about to push you out on, on to sea to escape the zombie apocalypse essentially yeah. and randall stops and this is beautiful but also makes no goddamn sense at the same time Randall remembers, you, you sort of piece it together as you go on, that his wife and child are dead. He killed them at the beginning of the outbreak. So it's kind of like, you have that realization, you're, like, you're thinking, oh, but at the same time you're thinking, well, why did you go on this whole adventure to go find them? You know? And it's like, and then uh, another beautiful moment is when he, he kicks the boat out. For for, the, for 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 his friend, mm -hmm. and she goes out and drifts on the sea in this nice big boat, and then he slams the gate behind her, and it, as well as him getting shot, he also gets eaten by zombies, mm -hmm. and that was his redemption. But it also doesn't make any sense. The same as Limbo, the, this ambiguity, mm -hmm. and this uh, sort of 
why'd they do this for? I don't like the ending of the whole game has this beautiful art style and this whole, you know, unweaving narrative, but it just it cuts itself off at an awkward point where it doesn't make sense. There, There is a thing, especially in when it comes to writing films, is that you always, like... Leaving films am- or leaving a story ambiguous at the end is not a bad is not a bad thing to do when it comes to writing. But the yeah. one thing that needs to be done with a lot of ambiguous endings is that the people who are writing it need to make a decision every yeah. single time. And a and a lot of the problems that I felt that I had with Limbo and that you are uh, feeling about Dying Light is Dead that light. Uh, sorry. Deadlight. Deadlight, okay. The problem with both of those is um, it feels like they didn't have... uh, They didn't make a decision. They didn't really know what they were doing. It was a... It was very much a a Lost situation. Did you ever see the TV show Lost? (laughs) It's really weird how I... I I watched a few of the first episodes and then I read up on the ending. Well, Well, the problem was is that the show ended up having this very ambiguous, like, there were a lot of questions left unanswered, which sort of went against the entire nature of the show being a show that gives you answers, sets up mysteries, and then answers them. But the problem was that it had too much ambiguous, uh, too many ambiguous things happening, and this is because the writers didn't know where they were going. They had, uh, they... They made it too convoluted. By season four, they were just going, we have no idea what we're doing. We don't know what's going to happen within the next episode. And all yeah. it ended up being was uh, was Cliffhanger the series is basically what the final seasons were. Christ. I feel like uh, I feel like the same situation happened with a lot of these writings as well, is that they didn't have a proper ending, but they wanted to make it... So they left it ambiguous so people could discuss it. As an excuse, they, like, oh, what happened? Ooh, yeah, but, they, but you would need... But you would need to have an ending that is... uh, You need to make that decision. If you're going to make it ambiguous, you yourself, as the writer, need to make that decision. Because that way, it will come across in the writing, even if you make it completely ambiguous. Uh, A good example of that is Inception. Um, Inception's left to be ambiguous, but but, uh, Christopher Nolan made its decision. He knew. He knew. He knew, yeah. Yeah, and yeah, so to be completely yeah. honest, if you followed the movie, you could probably figure it out yourself. But yep. uh, <laughs> but it is it is one of those things that I feel like there's a lot of great games out there that can be shown as art pieces. Um, yep. But a lot of them are going to be uh, are going to be dismissed by people because they're you know just big budget games. I feel like Bioshock Infinite is an artistic game, but because it's a you know a big budget first person shooter that you know you kill a bunch of guys because of that it's you know going to be dismissed as you know on the same level as Duke Nukem Forever or every Call of Duty game, despite yeah. the fact that it's got a lot more depth than those. And with with that point entirely, it's kind of like. The, the game Spec Ops The Line. No, oh, yes. Looking at Spec Ops The Line. Everyone said, oh, well, Spec Ops The Line, oh, it's just some generic third-person shooter. Mm-hmm. And then you play it, and it was just about the mental breakdown of someone going through hell in Dubai. Especially the white phosphorus scene. It was, oh, no, God. Yeah. Sickening. There, that is, the, I do really like Spec Ops The Line, and it is one of those games that I will never play again. I played it exactly. once, and it was, and it was, despite the fact that it was absolutely horrific, it was a very enjoyable experience. I will never play it again. Exactly, <laughs> because... it's the same with it. It's the same with Infinite, though. It's like once you get to the end, you don't really feel compelled to play it again. Mm-hmm. And it's the same thing. It was as you were saying, Spec Ops: The Line was heralded originally. Oh, it's a generic third-person shooter. Yep. Bioshock Infinite. Oh, it's a generic first-person shooter because people with these categories are putting games that have depth that have. The themes and emotions and so on. Uh, it's oh well, this game. Oh, it's it's like a game that's it's nothing like like oh it's it's like saying, well, Bioshock Infinite is like oh I don't know, uh, Duke Nukem Forever because they both have guns and shooting and regenerative and stuff. health and stuff. I would say yeah. I would say it would be more along the lines of like comparing Bioshock Infinite to the Call of Duty annual series and saying yeah. that. Oh, it's just like all the other COD games, you know. It's just the same thing over and over, and it's and yep. it's it's missing the fact that 
a lot of really good artistic games are maybe some of the ones that did have a big budget and maybe were meant to, you know, just sell a bunch of copies. And yeah. some of the less, not as good artistic games, unfortunately, are the ones that just didn't always have the best ideas for them. I don't, I don't want to badmouth the studio who made Limbo, but it just, for me, I didn't enjoy the experience as much as a lot of other people did. And so, I think that's due in part because you wanted a coherent, straightforward experience. You wanted to be well, not, your, your, not even that. I wanted, I, I wanted a consistent experience. And the thing was that it wasn't consistent. The giant spider that I'm constantly having to run from was really cool. It would have been nice if maybe at a later point I have to fight off a giant tick, or fight off a giant wasp, or fight off other giant yeah. things, and continue to fight on uh, in this you know dreary, bleak world. But it yep. turns in. But the entire game turns into just like puzzle after puzzle after puzzle after puzzle, and just beats you over the head with them. And they just get really annoying after a while to have to keep up with. <laughs> un un understandably, ag again to use the example of Deadlight. I mean, there's this one section which took me like two and a half hours, which is a long time. But what you had to do was you had to reroute power from. The, this this like opening door you had to shock the door mm -hmm. to make it open to run through to activate this like self lifting car thing the mechanics have lifts up the car in order to stand to avoid this like pit of zombies yeah. and well, it took me so long to do because it's never explained. And the only reason I figured out how to do it was literally, I was like moving around every pixel, like Sam and Max style, yeah. every pixel looking for something to do. And you know how you beat that stage, that, that, that bit? All you had to do was go outside to this tree house and there's like, if you rummage around like next to like, like hundreds of bits of like paper, like newspaper and stuff like that, there's one like small clipping which tells you what to do. Mm-hmm. So I was searching around for that for ages, and as soon as I figured it out, and you know the the, the electric fight fence comes down, and then you can go on and you know do whatever else. It's like, well, that was two and a half hours of my life that I didn't enjoy in a, a game I wanted to. Yeah. As you said, the the difficulty wrapped up with the puzzles, in which there wasn't a slow learning curve like something like Portal or Portal 2, mm. where, where they introduce you to every small thing. Every small mechanic and addition is, is you know, is, will, is willed in slowly, and you're, and, you know, you're eased into it, but it was like, it was like going along, like, a road at 50 miles an hour, and then it's suddenly, like, going vertical up into the sky. Mm. You know, it was hitting that, hitting that wall, that difficulty spike. Same difficulty curve that, uh, same difficulty curve that Psychonauts had then. Oh, yes. <laughs> I, I do love oh. Psychonauts, but god damn, is that level, last level hard. So, I believe we are close to out of time. Is there anything else you would like to talk about, Adam? Well, I kind of just want an excuse to talk about Assassin's Creed. <laughs> well, Unity's crap. Uh, not going to buy Rogue. Yep. Uh, yeah, you, buy Rogue. you can actually pre-order. Oh. You can pre-order Rogue on Steam. Don't do it. $39.99. Don't freaking do you it. Wanna do that. Yeah, do, don't, don't do it. Mainly because it's a reskin of Assassin's Creed 4, mm -hmm. but with like awful graphics, mm -hmm. an awful story, bad character. It's Assassin's Creed 3 again, basically. Yeah. And 3 sucked. 3 yeah. was awful. So, uh, there's this uh, last little section at the end of the podcast that... Uh, Let's be a little narcissistic and talk about what we're working on for I our channel. I love channels. narcissism. <laughs> That's, uh, it's now the narcissism section where we talk about Hooray. what are we doing with our channels. Uh, Adam, yes. what's what's on the future for Cold Steel Games? Well, well, for people who don't know who I am, my name is Adam. I run a channel called Cold Steel Games. I know, right? Self link is in the description. <laughs> oh yes, and what I do. It's it's weird. I started off as a gaming channel, but now I mainly just rant about things. Mm -hmm. And this could be anything from my my most recent episode about Anita Sarkeesian. Uh, yeah. Going back, uh, I'll give you a few examples, and you can just you know if you're interested, then please by all means, it's on the front page. Electronic Arts, mm -hmm. Xbox One, Linkara, Smosh, Miley Cyrus, mm -hmm. uh, loads of stuff like mm -hmm. Minecraft YouTubers, celebrities, that sort of thing. I also do gaming videos on occasion, you know, and mm. that sort of thing. But I'm working currently on I Watched The Walking Dead, which and uh, the Unity walkthrough, and The Walking Dead, uh, the game, I'm doing a walkthrough on that as well, mm. which is slowly coming out, which, if you're interested in that kind of thing, it's all going to be released soon. 
But I watched The Walking Dead. It's just kind of like a roundup on everything that's happened so far, leading into 5B that's coming out tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Are you a fan of The Walking Dead, Ian? I actually uh, read the original uh, graphic novels, and I really liked them, but I have not seen the TV series, and I do... I would, re- I would recommend the show, but I've never read the original source material, so I can't tell you how accurate it is. I Well, I can, uh, I can tell you that from what I've briefly seen of the first seasons, that they follow the <clears throat> first graphic novel fairly well, but I don't know. I've heard that it kind of... Uh, differs after a while from like season three and four gets a bit different. Um, yeah, I mean, like um, they've been like adding in characters that weren't originally in the source material. Like, are they, are they, were, 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 were Merle and Daryl in the source material? Daryl, uh, Daryl was. Yeah, I, I think so, I think Daryl was in the original graphic novel. I'd have I've got I've got it on my shelf actually. I should probably just like look at it and be like, <laughs> I will there find he is. it eventually. <laughs> But yes, uh, as uh, as for me and our channel, we actually have started a Patreon, which please, people, go to our Patreon, because it would yeah. get us one step closer to being able to do this full time, which yeah. is our ultimate goal. Um, which, they, which these people, these, sorry to cut you off, but you, de- you definitely deserve to do this full time. I'm just going to like jump in a bit. I've bashed Patreon for many reasons, but you guys need Patreon because you make fucking good content. <laughs> you do. You make fucking television like quality content that would be right at home airing on a fucking TV station, hmm. and hmm. it's up there. It gets a good amount of views. <coughs> we could be doing more. You you know you hmm. need this fucking funding, right? Yeah. So please support this fucking channel because it's awesome. Our Patreon is uh, patreon.com slash gaming wildlife, and uh, a couple of the things that we're doing, we're starting, uh, we're going to, I don't know when the episode's going to air, uh, it's going to take place in one of our weekly episodes, but we've started to put together a review show called Review Roulette, where basically oh, like we that. will uh, put all of the people who are part of gaming wildlife into a, you know, random number counter thing get, get one, the revolvers yeah one it, it like like russian roulette is basically and the person who gets the bullet has to do a review of that week of something that they are interested in the show that i'm going to be doing for review roulette uh is uh oh shoot i forgot the name i just came up with it and i forgot it um it's basically how to improve um stories in films and video games well basically like just stories in general but i will talk about something that i've watched or played recently and how they could have improved the story how they could have gotten the story better because i've always felt and as many of you who are you know fans of gaming wildlife can roll your eyes as hard as you want but i've always felt that a good script is the most important thing more than anything yeah. else. It's not just it, like actors are important. Yes, a good director is important. Good uh, sound edit, uh, sound quality, video quality, and everything else is important. But above all else is a good script. If you do not have yeah. a good script, everything else is going to fall apart. And my review show is going to be looking at that and saying how could these have been improved. And I'll even look at good movies. One of the first episodes I'm going to do is Frozen, <laughs> which I love Frozen, but. It could I, only, I only recently watched that, and I gotta say, it was pretty good. It's just, it didn't really set, you know, the world on fire. I thought it was on par with Tangled, to be honest. It, you know. But anyway, um, the other thing <laughs> that we're working on with Wildlife is uh, we've got two episodes we tried to shoot last month, and they kind of fell apart, uh, mostly because one was way bigger than we thought it was going to be, and the other one, uh, we had uh we had a bunch of actor problems within that week we just finished filming uh one which you can actually see we put that up on monday and it was called the pc master race episode master race <laughs> oh you're not gonna like it adam <laughs> because it's master going race. it's because it's going to make fun of the pc master race <laughs> that's the I, entire I, I, I sit here with my 1600 pound computer <laughs> with the gtx 970 and the 970. i7 4790k and it's mm. But yeah, no, it it is gonna kind of make fun of them in a way. We're also working on an episode about arcades. About, oh yes, uh, hell yes. About where? Uh, yeah, I gotta about say, our... if you need me in any capacity for any of this, 
text me, talk to me on Skype, anything. I will. I want to help you with these sorts of things. And the other thing that we're working on, the next 100% Honest, in case you guys are interested at all, because uh, last month we did Bethesda, but we yeah. left out a few things, especially with their parent company, Zenimax. Oh, do, do, do ESO. Mm-hmm. So, that's what's coming up with Gaming Wildlife. That's what's coming up with Cold Steel Games. This has been oh, the yes. state of gaming, people. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you for watching. We hope, we hope you enjoyed this. Go check out Adam at youtube.com slash coldsteelgames. Please subscribe to Gaming Wildlife at youtube.com slash gamingwildlife. And we will see you later when we check up on the state of gaming.